Wish TV. All Indiana politics is your premier source for Indiana politics. Focusing on issues that matter to you. I still want us to be the best in the Midwest. We can't afford another lockdown. Give the citizens of this country the relief they need. Education in the state of Indiana remains priority number one. In-depth nonpartisan coverage. We don't know exactly where the economy will be in January. People are worried with good reason. Exclusive interviews with Indiana's political leaders. We have the resources here in the state of Indiana to care for those who are in need. Expert analysis on critical legislation. We need to reform those laws. This recovery is going to take some time. We've got to anticipate that there'll be a budget shortfall. From Wish TV, this is All Indiana Politics Podcast on the All Indiana Podcast Network. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to another edition of All Indiana Politics. I'm Phil Sanchez. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris aren't the only names on Hoosiers presidential ballots this fall. Chase Oliver is carrying the Libertarian Party's mantle this year. Oliver is from Atlanta, Georgia. He's 39 years old. He got started in politics protesting against the Iraq war. During a visit to Indiana this week, he stopped by our studios and talked to our government reporter, Garrett Berquist. Joining us now is the Libertarian candidate for President of the United States, Chase Oliver. Chase, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me. I look forward to speaking with you and uh, speaking to your audience today. So why are you running for president? Well, I honestly think that America deserves more than two choices uh, from a failed two-party system. I don't fit into the political binary, and I know a lot of voters don't as well. We in the Libertarian Party are the third largest political party in the United States, and we want to win. We want to be able to grow ourselves, to be a contender to the two-party system, and inject at least a third voice uh, into the system, and hopefully uh, break it open so that we can have many more voices being represented across the spectrum. One of the big issues that's come up in Indiana is the cost of housing, and that's certainly not unique to our state. There are, of course, some federal programs dealing with housing, such as Section 8. At the federal level, what would an Oliver administration do to help people find affordable housing? Honestly, I think what we need to do as much as possible is disengage the federal government from that, uh, from the housing market altogether and rely on free market practices. But to do that, we have to use the power of the bully pulpit to actually break down housing regulations uh, and zoning regulations in cities and states uh, all across this country. Um, I want to see you know, uh, high density housing being built in cities where it's needed. The biggest impediment to that is the NIMBY liberal the person who says, not in my backyard, hey, we need the housing somewhere, but just not close to me because it'll affect my property values or affect my day-to-day. Um, I think we need to remove the barriers to creating new housing. Um, and I don't think the federal government has a hand necessarily in building new homes. Uh, you know, just the same as with gov- government doesn't create jobs. You know, politicians say, I created X number of jobs. They also don't build homes. Home builders build homes. Businesses build homes. Uh, and we need to create the conditions that make it more affordable to actually build. And a lot of that is getting the cost of goods down. You've called for simplifying the immigration process. What would that look like in practice? What specifically would you like to do there? Well, I call our platform a 21st century Ellis Island. The reason being is that 40% of Americans can trace a relative that came to this country through Ellis Island in the 19th and 20th centuries during the last great migration wave. And during that time, folks came to our shores, they declared who they were, went through a health check, and if everything was good to go, they were allowed to come into this country. Uh, and, and so that is uh, what we need to be doing at our southern border, is streamlining the process. If you want to come here to this country to work, come declare who you are to a background check, to a health check. And then if you're good to go, be given a visa to get to work and let the market dictate where labor needs to go and where the jobs are. What about those crossing illegally? And for that matter, what would you do about the flow of drugs, especially fentanyl across the southern border? So I think if you had a streamlined process uh, where people could come here and declare who they are to be able to get a job or be able to get status to work, uh, you would see far less people actually trying to illegally come through the border. And we could actually laser focus our law enforcement on those who would still be trying to do that, because if they are, there's a good chance are doing it for the purposes of, uh, say, uh, you know, human trafficking for the purposes of labor or sexual exploitation, or as you said, bringing fentanyl across our border. Now, I'm a libertarian. I want to see the end of the drug war overall. I believe in decriminalizing all drugs. But I think what we're seeing at our southern border is a case of fraud, where fentanyl is being made to look like Xanax or other drugs, and people are taking these drugs thinking it's one thing and it's another, and that's what's causing the overdose. Let's talk about that a little bit more. And ending the war on drugs has long been a libertarian party goal. What are some other things that you would do to address the fentanyl crisis? Well, you know, as I said, you know, what we are seeing here is a case of fraud. Most people who are overdosing on fentanyl don't know they're taking fentanyl. Uh, 
And so if you had a decriminalized world where you could properly test your product, you would have higher, uh, you know, you would have higher quality, I, I would hate to say, higher quality drugs that are less likely to be cut with fentanyl. Uh, you would have more awareness for a user to know what they're taking, uh, and you would create less stigma for those who are maybe wanting to suss out, you know, what it is uh, that they might be ingesting to their body. And so this is something that would save lives. I've seen it actually happen, harm reduction strategies where you pass out fentanyl testing strips, Narcan, and other things. Uh, at the community level to help prevent the worst cases of overdose. Um, but at the end of the day, if fentanyl was legal, I don't think you're going to use it. I don't think I'm going to use it. As long as we know what we're ingesting in our body, I think that's what we really need when it comes to uh, drug use and drug awareness. You said that we should end restrictions on abortions before viability, and that's the exact wording on your website. Would you push for a federal law to that end? Yes. I believe that body autonomy and medical privacy should allow an individual to make that choice for themselves. And it should be determined by the most local government possible, which is your own self-governance. Uh, but we have to have the conditions to protect people's privacy rights and medical freedom to allow them to make that very difficult decision. And I'm not going to want to make that decision for anyone. I don't think any government bureaucrat should be making that decision up to the point of viability and post-viability in those very rare instances. It should be a doctor that determines whether the health or life of the mother is at risk, not a government board who has to investigate these things. I just think that that uh, is the place for that kind of decision making, that there's no room for government uh, in, in that very, very private uh, choice that you should be allowed to have. And I just want to be clear here, so you would push for a federal law legalizing abortion and overriding state-level bans, such as the one we have here in Indiana? Yes. If there was a, uh, if the standard of Roe v. Wade and Casey were brought to a bill by Congress to my desk, I would sign it because I do believe all people deserve uh, that body autonomy. I do want to say this, though. There are things that we can do with the pro-life community to actually reduce the number of abortions in this country and partner with them in that. Things like legalizing, or uh, not legalizing, but uh, making uh, birth control over the counter so it's easier to access that contraception. Removing the red tapes and barriers around adoption so more people choose to become adoptive parents so surrog surrogacy becomes a more viable option instead of terminating a pregnancy. So there are things we can certainly do in this uh, country partnering pro-life and pro-choice community together to prevent unwanted pregnancies to begin with. All right, coming up, we press Oliver on aid to Israel and Ukraine and whether voting for a third party candidate is a waste of vote. Welcome back on this Sunday morning. We continue our conversation now with Libertarian presidential candidate Chase Oliver. As we mentioned at the top of the show, he started out as an anti-war activist. We asked him how he would handle the conflicts in Ukraine and Gaza. Let's turn to foreign policy. Would you end American military aid to Ukraine? Yes, I would end United States military aid across the board as much as possible. I think if there is a need for more military aid to Ukraine, Western Europe can take the lead there as we examine what uh, what we can do from a humanitarian point of view to alleviate the suffering in Ukraine. Uh, I would like to see more private organizations be able to sponsor refugees to come to the United States and settle until the war is over. And ultimately, I believe conscription, uh, being forced to fight in a military, is uh, wrong, and that is a great reason to be able to claim asylum. And I would tell the Russian military, many of whom are conscripts who don't want to fight and die in Ukraine, that if they lay down their arms and declare themselves, uh, we will provide them amnesty to come to the United States, because I don't believe you should have to fight in a war that Putin's forcing you to fight uh, if you would rather live in peace. What about aid to Israel? Uh, aid to Israel, I, uh, again, I believe in removing all military aid. I think we need to shift our foreign policy to one that's more based in diplomacy, free trade, and voluntary exchange. Uh, but, you know, Israel had a right to respond to October 7th. I think if that had happened in Indianapolis, we would be demanding a response from our own government here at home uh, if such an attack were to happen to us. I think the manner in which Israel has responded to that attack has been so heavy handed in the terms of lives lost, casualties, that tens of thousands of innocent people, billions of dollars of infrastructure destroyed that's going to have to be rebuilt for the Palestinian people. Um, I think that is what has turned much of the goodwill of the world against Israel. And that's not a result of the Israeli people, many of whom want to see peace and a ceasefire as well. It's a result of their government. And I like to remind people that when I have criticism of Israel, it is towards the Netanyahu government, not the people of Israel, just as my criticism of Hamas is not towards the Palestinian people. 
Our national debt is now at 35 trillion with a T and still climbing. What's your plan to bring it down? Well, I think that's actually the most important thing that we need to be addressing uh, as candidates for president is what are we going to do to address the debt and deficit? Uh, I believe in balancing the federal budget immediately. Uh, I would challenge Congress to submit me a balanced budget if I were elected president. If it's not balanced, it will be vetoed and Congress would have to override because I don't want to add one more dollar of debt and deficit to our kids and grandkids. Uh, and I believe in challenging Congress to meet that uh, as those, you know, it is their job to hold the purse strings, but that would involve lots of slashing redundancies, a huge amount of Pentagon cuts. Uh, you'd have to address the entitlement spending. There would really be nothing left off the table in terms of what we need to cut uh, in term, you know, so that we can make ourselves a balanced budget because the highest driver of inflation is that debt and deficits, the printing of trillions of dollars a year out of thin air. And uh, that's what is most affecting households each and every month when they look at the bills, when they're trying to make ends meet and they see themselves stretching paycheck to paycheck, the best thing we can do is get our fiscal house in order as a government so that way we can create more prosperity in the future uh, for families across the country. Now here in Indiana, we just had about 1,600 medically complex children who were removed from the Medicaid attendant care program. That was part of an effort to close about a billion dollar uh, funding gap in Medicaid here in the state of Indiana. That's led to some very, very significant hardship on the part of those families. How would you head off those kinds of effects writ large if you were to impose massive spending cuts nationwide? Well, there's two things I want to say. Uh, first, I think much of what the federal government does should be left to the states or local governments, uh, you know, per the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. Those are the, you know, um, that's the constitutional role of much of what we would cut out of the federal government. That would be block granted back to the states to have to maintain and handle. Uh, but there will be pain. I don't want to be a liar. Uh, there will be pain as we transition ourselves to a more balanced budget and remove ourselves from the entitlement trap that we've been in uh, since before I was born. There would have been less pain if we had done this 20 years ago, and there will be more pain if we do it 20 years from now. And as a millennial who sees the car going off the cliff, I'm trying to steer ourselves away, even if it causes some discomfort. And I recognize that no plan is perfect, but this is the best way to remove ourselves away from being dependent on the government uh, and, and continuing to see rising costs because of that. Uh, and, and so, you know, I recognize that there will be uh, pain in this process. But that's also being honest in a way that Republicans and Democrats never have been when it comes to entitlement spending. Uh, but the way we're going to address that in our communities is through charity and through us taking care of our communities at the local level. You know, uh, one of the biggest things I want to get across as libertarians, just because we don't think the government should do something, doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. It just means that we think that the government is one of the more inefficient and terrible ways of doing those things. For a lot of voters this fall, the thing that is most paramount to them is keeping either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris out of the White House. What do you say to people who might look at you and say, well, if I vote for this guy, all I'm doing is ensuring that whichever of those two I dislike more goes into the Oval Office. Well, you know, there's a great solution to that. If you convince enough of your friends and neighbors to vote for me, you can actually keep both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris out of the White House. But absent that, uh, what I tell people is, you know, I am not here to spoil something because the two-party system is already spoiled rotten. If you look at the congressional approval ratings regularly under 20 percent, yet the incumbent re-election rate regularly over 90 percent, that tells you this system is broken, that people are dissatisfied but they're not able to see the change they want to see. And so the only way to make that change happen is to help a third party grow, to help create more prominence for us, to help us win ballot access or major party status across this country, and to help create something that will challenge this two-party system and tear it down uh, piece by piece. The only way to do that is to vote differently. Uh, and when you do that, another thing happens. Democrats and Republicans really start paying attention to you because if you get the 5, 10, 20 percent, they're going to really say, OK, what can we do to earn those votes back? And so even if we don't end up winning, we win when they steal our best ideas and put them forward. Chase Oliver, thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Coming up, Indiana's best political team assesses the presidential debate and Mayor Joe Hogg sets answers about a sexual harassment scandal. Welcome back to All Indiana Politics as we welcome in two members of Indiana's best political team, Democrat Dana Black and Republican Mario Masolmani. Good to see you both. Let's begin with the debate between former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris. Mario, we'll start with you. Trump, 
let well i i don't think it was trump's best night you okay. know i think that i think that he could have done better and uh, to be honest with you i think that uh, kamala harris uh, performed uh, well in, in in comparison so uh you know but d is this debate going to make any difference i don't think so uh, at the end of the day as i've uh, said from day one this is going to come down to about six or seven states and really a few thousand people within those six or seven states are going to decide who's going to be the next president and i don't think any of those people were really watching the debate uh do i think that the debate could have been better for donald trump yes uh do i think that he got out the points that he needed to get out as it pertains to illegal immigration how bad the economy is yes could he have done better and been a little bit more articulate in those answers yes uh -huh. um i don't think the moderators did him any favors and i think the moderators really didn't hold kamala harris to task either uh, in the fact that you know she was kind of a little bit all over the place she was warm and fuzzy if anything uh, as even my sons who were watching the debate with me said she sounded like or tried to sound like Obama. And it, it, it sounds like she is trying to be the next version of the second coming of Obama in some of the things that she was talking about in her debate. Nothing really uh, as specifics regarding policy. It was kind of just a little hope and change sort of stuff. And it's hard to have hope and change when you're the one that's been the vice president for the last four years. OK, I'll bring Dana in now. Dana, you were with me on, on that night. Uh, it's been said in recent years that debates don't really matter, given what we've seen in that Trump-Harris and also the Trump-Biden debates, do they still matter? I think they do matter. I mean, will it have an impact on the outcome of the, of the race? Maybe, maybe not. But it may actually solidify who was actually prepared to be president, even the one that had been president before. I think Kamala Harris mopped the floor with Donald Trump. She was able to bait him into going off on the crowd sizes and dog eating and all of the nonsense, that doesn't matter. She also showed that it doesn't matter what type of bully you put in front of her, she will be able to handle herself with grace, style, and every now and then a little pity on her face because he looked really bad. He looked like he needed some therapy, actually. Honestly, you have one person who is ready to lead us into the future, and you have another person that all he did was complain and continues to complain and live in the past. He had zero vision for the future of America and how he plans to help American citizens moving forward. She had plans. She articulated those plans. And then, she, again, she was able to make him look really stupid, spun him around so much that he had to go into the spin room and spin himself. To that point, Mario, you know, a lot has been said about a possible second debate between those two. I saw Kamala Harris say that she would welcome a second debate. Does, does Trump get back up on that stage with her? I don't think it's necessary. It's not like she talked about a plan. I love Dana, okay? But what plan in, in, in the hour and 30 minutes did she hear from Kamala Harris? It was like, everyone deserves a house. We want to make sure that our kids are taken care of. Well, you've been in office for four years as the vice president, and our economy is doing terribly. No one feels better now than they did four years ago under Donald Trump. So, and she's like, hey, I'm not Joe Biden. Well, you're under the Joe Biden administration. You've been uh, his vice president for the last four years. And we have dealt with high inflation, people not being able to afford their gas uh, or their utilities. People aren't able to afford the groceries uh, at, uh, to put food on their table. This is Kamala Harris, Joe Biden administration for the last four years. Anyone listening and watching today, Dana, ask yourself, do you feel better today Dana, than you did four I, 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 I want to let, no. let you respond quickly, but I, I have to go, move on to Mayor Joe Hogsett. So quick response. First of all, the vice president does not write policy. The president does. And I know everybody keeps saying that she's been in office. She was administering the Biden program, and she di differentiated herself through policy from Joe Biden. Also, she did articulate a plan. I she talked that. about a child credit. She talked about um, giving $25,000 to new home buyers. So even though y'all don't want to say that those are plans, of course, y'all keep hey, waiting quickly, on a Quickly, guys, quickly. I have a, a minute left, so I got to get, get Mayor Hogsett in here. Uh, your take from each of you on what happened this week. He answered some questions in regards to the scandal going on in his office. Dana, you first, 30 seconds. Absolutely. So when you love somebody, you have to make sure you tell the truth. And I do love, I have a love for Mayor Joe Hawk said. He did not uh, 
do well for himself in that in that press conference um, he, where he really messed up. Yes, he turned everything over to the, his uh, HR and the legal team, as we discussed previously. But when he brought him back onto the campaign, that was problematic. Yeah. I really wish he hadn't done that. I'm still not asking for him to re re resign. But as someone who cares about Joe Hawkshead and, and that administration, I right. wish he had Mario, done a whole lot better. I want to get you in here quickly. 20 seconds. Listen, Democrats talk about uh, protecting women's rights in the state of Indiana. In the, under the largest Democrat administration in the state of Indiana, they failed that. They didn't fail that uh, once. They failed that numerous times over years. More than 20, 25 staffers have said that this is All a right. toxic environment. That's under Democrat leadership. They are not we'll protecting right women's there. rights. Guys, uh, unfortunately, we had a lot to talk to, a, a lot to talk about, rather. Unfortunately, we we're out of time. Good to see you both. Thank you so much. We will be right back. Thank you for joining us for All Indiana Politics. We'll be back here next Sunday morning at 930. And remember, tune in on October 3rd for our live debate in the race for governor. From Wish TV, this is All Indiana Politics podcast on the All Indiana Podcast Network. Watch All Indiana Politics live Sunday mornings at 930 on Wish TV and at wishtv.com. Subscribe to this podcast and listen weekly here on the All Indiana Podcast Network. And be sure to discover even more great podcasts at allindianapodcastnetwork.com.